Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Anastasia Kinigopolo and I'm the director and curator of the Horseman Foundation. Our mission is to expand scholarship and appreciation of American art, but particularly works by artists who have been omitted from the canon due to their race, gender, or geographic locale. For those of you who are joining us from around the country who might not be familiar with St. Louis, the Horseman Foundation and our premises are located on the traditional lands of the Osage Nation, the Missouri, and the Illini Confederacy, who have stewarded this land for generations. The foundation actively strives to center the living history of indigenous peoples and to celebrate their historic and ongoing contributions to this region and beyond. And I am so very excited to welcome you here today to the uh, last installment of the Horseman Foundation Artist Talks for 2022, though we'll be back next year. Uh, so this is a series of artist talks we're doing in conjunction with our online exhibition, Traditions and Transformations, Modern and Contemporary Native Visions from the Horseman Collection. You can find that on our website at thehorsemanfoundation.org. And you can also sign up for our mailing list for uh, information about future artist talks. Today, I will be speaking with DNA artist and quilt maker, Susan Hudson. Before I get started, I wanna just let everyone know that some of the issues that we'll be discussing, which Susan's work brings much needed attention to, uh, touch on issues including abuse, sexual assault, violence, and genocide, which some viewers might not be comfortable with. And we certainly don't wanna catch anyone in the audience unaware. Uh, we'll also be taking a couple questions from audience members after the talk, so just take a quick look. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, so feel free to enter any questions you have. And I'm going to very briefly introduce Susan, and we will get started. Susan Hudson is an artist and cult maker and a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Though her family is originally from Sheep Springs, New Mexico, she grew up in Los Angeles, where her mother, a survivor of an Indian boarding school, was relocated to. Her mother taught Susan how to sew when she was nine years old. As we'll see, Susan Hudson's work addresses the injustices endured by the Diné, or the Navajo, people and celebrates their remarkable strength and determination through a unique visual aesthetic that borrows from Northern Plains ledger art. Her quilts have depicted issues, including the devastating legacy of Indian boarding schools, Long Walk of the Navajo, and the ongoing epidemic of murdered and missing indigenous women, a tragedy she has been personally affected by. She was featured on the PBS program, uh, Cracked in America, and exhibits regularly around the country. In addition to the annual Santa Fe Indian Market, she has shown her work at museums, including the Herd, the Ida Georgia Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, the Autry Museum of the American West, and the Museum of, the, of International Folk Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. We're absolutely thrilled to have you here. Oh, yeah, thanks. Susan Hudson, this leg, Kiani, this leg, this Pini Bachachi, Tabaha, Gachate, Nakaida, the Tsunali. I live in Potsoi, Sheep Springs, New Mexico. Welcome, welcome to this. I'm really, really honored to be speaking to everybody, and thank you to Anastasia. Crossman Foundation, and I would like to acknowledge um, the land that we all walk upon, this whole world of Mother Mother Earth, uh, for our ancestral cultural people and our ancestors. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge my ancestors and my grandmas and my aunties, and especially my mother, and my children. And I also like to acknowledge that. Well, my LGBTQ plus family, you know, love you. Free hugs to everybody. I would do that because um, in our way, the LGBTQ, uh, well, that's what they were called in the old days, but in the creation stories, they're the ones that make sure that we didn't have any homeless, we didn't have any orphans, and they settled a lot of disputes, whereas now um, they're, um, hey, they signed it, uh, um, uh, uh, Joe Biden, the president, signed that for for the families, and I'm really, really happy. You know, and so um, I grew up with a lot of them. They were my best friends, and uh, you know, I just appreciate every one of them. And there's a reason why you guys will see next year why I'm talking. <laughs> Thank you. 
So thank, thank you, and we're we're so happy to have you here. Um, and so let's get let's get started. Uh, actually, for everyone joining us today, I know art historians we tend to watch these uh, these clips sort of at the corner of our screen. If there's ever a time to expand uh, your Zoom window into full screen, this is the time to do it. The work is really, Susan's work is so beautiful and it's so detailed uh, and it's worth just being able to take a look at it. So um, today we'll get started. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this first work, Susan? Okay, uh, just to um, reiterate um, the trigger warning, I do talk about rape, pedophiles, uh, human trafficking, uh, all sorts of things that um, happen every day, every second. We have an epidemic in this country of our missing and murdered uh, relatives. I kind of not like, I really don't like to just say the women because it's the children and the men. Uh, and so I do certain things because on this quote right here, the missing and murdered indigenous women since 1492. Uh, if you look at this, what I did on the side is I put a lot of sayings in there, you know, because uh, since the invaders, when um, the colonists came, um, they always looked at us as inferior, we were dirty and everything. And then I remind people that if you look at the people that came over here, if you look at their countries and how they they lived, you know, when they're throwing their poop out the window and they're, you know, we've got a plague and all this and they're gonna come over and talk about us and, you know, we didn't live in the houses like that. We had a system in place, you know, all of us. We took we took care of each other. And when they came over too, they had um, this belief that their skin color was, they were better than us and they could do whatever they want to us and nobody was gonna protest or anything because we were just dirty people. When, so it, I wanted to humanize to have people realize that this is somebody's mother, somebody's auntie, someone's grandmother, somebody's child, somebody that we don't know hundreds of years ago. We don't know their names, but we still remember them. And when they're killed and murdered and everything, that, that's the end of the line for them. And so on the side that I have, I talk about you know, the hair, the beauty of our hair, that um, an, an auntie or somebody made a brush and brushed their hair, you know, even when they were little babies. And that, you know, uh, they, and our hair is our beauty. And one of the things they would do, especially like in the boarding schools, would cut the hair. And so that had a traumatic effect on a lot of children. And when you look at all the little dresses, what was really great about this quilt uh, was that I had my grandchildren help me. And I had them helping me sew um, the dresses. And I wanted them to be part of this to understand the story. And in the four, four of them, there's the old style clothes and then there's the new style clothes. And you know, uh, you wanna, I wanted it to, to look like a, in, um, you're looking in somebody's closet. Um, huh. All of us have experienced this or, or everybody has is when somebody in your family walks on or dies, you have to go and you have to take care of the clothing. So when you open up that closet, sometimes maybe there's a smell in there. If they had perfume after shave or whatever, you know, cause uh, um, we had our own perfumes too. Uh, it wasn't made in France, we had our own. <laughs> and that smell come back. And then you yeah. can remember that person maybe wearing that dress or something, hugging you, you know, feeding you, butchering, you know, chopping wood. And, and I was kind of like basing it like that. And girls, you know, uh, when they, nowadays, they got, well, we all did it. We go in the house and then just throw our stuff all around you. Know, we were messy. <laughs> Last time I was told that I was really, really had to put it. I, hey, I totally understand that, but I was, I'm a messy person. And so on the, um, on the top where the buckskin dress is at, I have it where the beadwork isn't done because the uh, hmm. ones that were making the clothes at the time that the, the young lady or whoever was, they were in the process of making the clothes. And so what they did was put it away until they came back. 
And that's what I want to do to show the CL our hair, our beauty, our bags, for, for our medicine, our moccasins, the white on the bottom, we're walking in the clouds. And um, years ago, um, not too long ago, it's, I think it's been six years now, uh, little Ashlyn Mike, um, it was all over the news, uh, her and her brother were kidnapped. Well, Ashlyn's mother were first cousins. Um, so that had a really profound effect on all of us because it hit mm -hmm. so close to home. And if you knew how tiny she was, it was like, you know, this monster did all this stuff to her. And it's just, um, so what I did was honored her with the little Navajo dress right there with the yellow and the, the mm -hmm. purple. So I wanted to honor her that way. And also when I was doing this, I had asked a whole bunch of ladies to help me out, you know, to give me thoughts and everything. And only one lady, um answer back and that was Gina and what mm. Gina did was she was really good friends with John Trudeau and he's been gone a couple of years too but she said that to come back that um the ones that they would find and bring back the remains that they were sent back to the they were women uh, the womb back into mother earth they were returned mm. home uh, and so it was a beautiful saying. So I put that down there to, to honor her and to honor John Trudell because he always says it's a good day to be indigenous. <laughs> the cow came and took them away. So that's what I did in this one. And um, I made people really uncomfortable, but I don't care. You know, and I didn't care. And so you, uh, you could tell how you can really tell is by the color of my ribbons when I was wearing, winning third places and, you know, and all this. It's, it was okay. So this one was shown at the International Quilt Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And then uh, the Idle Door wanted to borrow it. Um, so they borrowed it and then the International Quilt Museum in uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska borrowed it. Uh, and so I went over there and I talked and then last year, then I got an email, they purchased it. So now, I mean, of I all know. the places, I always say my folks <laughs> choose where they want to go. I don't choose where they want to go. And people come up to me and you know tell me how much, and I tell them. And if they're willing to pay the price, then they go. And then that means that quotes meant to go with them. So I never, in the wildest dreams, thought it would go there. I didn't even huh. obviously. I didn't even know really about the museum. You know, I I'm not really into the non-native quilt world. Yeah. Fine, but now now I got drugged in. And I'm okay. It's interesting. One of the things I'm so struck by with your work is that I think for a lot of people that are used to quilt work and non the non-native quilt world is so I mean they're very disarming objects, I think, even though there's a lot of scholarship around quilts, I think. And has that um is that been something that you think about when you make this work that this is kind of I think people approach quilts and they're like oh it's a quilt and then when they see the subject matter of your work it's quite it's quite startling and quite incredible because it it almost lulls you into this false sense of like oh it's going to be this you know the lovely thing and then it's quite powerful when you see what the actual subject matter is. And I'll actually move on to the next slide because it, okay. I think, perfectly exemplifies this. So on, on, on what I do is I've been given a gift. Ever since I was little, I would see images and I never knew what it was. And, you know, growing up in California and everything, um, the assimilation. And so uh, during that time, we couldn't even say we were Native. We couldn't even say we were mm. Navajo. We couldn't even say we were Indian. We, could, we had to say we were Mexican. So we can get a place to live. That's how bad it was in those wow. days. And um, so when I, I used to see all these things, but I didn't have anybody to talk to. And what I do is I have these dreams. You know, I've been given this gift. I dream and I pray. And what I do is like, I see these pictures and they'll come and then it'll be right there. And so it's like, I say, it's like, I have two files. It either goes into the delete file or goes into this other file. And after they're all done, all those deletes go away and it empties mm -hmm. out and then the file comes back. And all the ones that were over here, 
they'll show me again. They'll show and they'll start the whole process. And then I'll start dreaming, dreaming about them. And I, and I, you know, some of these, this one here, I dreamt about, I could, I was there. I could smell, you know, the, the blood. I could, you know, the, the gunpowder. I can, I can smell out the fear, you know, the, you know, because they didn't use deodorant in days and they used a lot of wool and a lot of the non in the soldiers, they didn't wash or they stank. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you could smell all that, you know, you can hear the screaming, the crying, and then all of a sudden the silence. And then, you know, to be there, the fear of what you're going to do. And this one is the walk of my ancestors. And what I wanted to show was, this is the first one of, of two. This one I wanted to show the first year of the long walk of the Navajos when Kit Carson came with the army and they went into Canyon de Shea and they killed all the sheep, burned the, house, the Hogans. You know, and they, they did this, they're so, oh my God, they're so chicken poop. Um, they didn't want to, they picked on, the, the children, the, old, the elders, the women, you know, they, that's what they did. And uh, they went in there in the winter and they just went in there and they just did all that. And so they have caves up there in Canyon de Chez where um, the warriors would um, try to keep uh, fight off the soldiers. So the women and the children and the elderly can go up into this cage. And what they did, uh, you see right there, the Gatlin gun, uh, what I did instead of bullets is drops of blood. They would uh, hit the mouth of the cave and it would ricochet. And so oh. they would kill them or they would be wounded and they would leave them there. And you can hear them the moaning and the crying and then the babies, you know, and uh, and so they're still there. They're the, the remains are still there, but nobody goes up there. It's called the canon of death. And so what, that's the starting of the long walk of the Navajo. And I wanted to show that, you know, the hope on there, even the weaving. And that took a little bit of what I was doing because I actually had to sit there and, you know, kind of weave a little bit. And I'm not a weaver. I'm Navajo, but I am not a weaver, people. I hear so many, are you a jeweler? I'm like, no, no, I'm a quilter. And they're like, oh. yeah, it's, it's a long story. And so that. That is one of the remarkable things about your work is, and you've met, you've said this before, where people are surprised that you're using quilt work to, it, it's certainly not a traditional medium for, for Navajo artists who tend to, you know, typically people associate weaving or silver work. Um, has there, and there's been, as you said, kind of a sort of, very much a reaction to to this unusual choice of using quilt work, but I can't really imagine any other medium having sort of this the impact that your work does through that. I I was kind of surprised that people well a lot of people didn't understand what I was doing because mm. I I if you look at the lines I do ledger quilts. I'm mm -hmm. telling the story, but everybody associates the Plains Indians with ledger art. So I had a, a uh, one of my uh, good buddies of mine is a retired Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, and I was his quilt maker. And he told me that I was born and blah, blah, blah. So I told him I was always fascinated with um, ledger art. And mm -hmm. I would say, every tribe has ledger arts, just not the Plains Indians because the soldiers came, you know, the, uh, the BIL Indian Affairs or the superintendents or whoever, they had ledgers. You, you talk with uh, the traders, they had ledgers. Uh, and, you know, you draw in the, the dirt. We've all drawn on the dirt, maybe. <laughs> um, so I want, I, wanted to do something different. So Ben says, go ahead, try it. So that's what I did. And I was, I'm gonna tell her stories because that's what I see. And that's the gift I was given. And if I don't tell my ancestor stories, I don't want somebody else telling the stories because mm -hmm. when I'm talking about my quilts, somebody will come up and say, well, this is what I thought when you were making it. And I'm like, I don't care what you thought. These are my quilts, you don't <laughs> like it. Oh, get out of my booth, I don't care. 
you're not going to tell me my story because you don't know my story. And then, like, if you look on the bottom, I will show you when they were welded. But if you look uh, with a little, with the soldiers, okay, so the soldiers were making money uh, off the slavers, you know, because, you know, they were uh, pedophiles, they were rapists. And so they were selling the children, they were slavers. Uh, so you see uh, in the wagon, I do a lot of stuff. And then hmm. uh, the church sanctioned it. So if you look at the wheels, they're upside down crosses with the blood coming down. And then on the boards is the Mexican flag. But if you see where the soldiers, where all the bodies are on the ground, there's a one lady standing there holding the baby. So I tell people, if that was you and you had a child, were you sad your child died or were you leave, relieved that your child was has oh. died so your child doesn't have to go through all of this? What would you do? What would you think? What would you feel? And that's what that that of all of them, that's the one that gets them and also up in the cave. Those are the two things that they talk about a lot. And they kind of skirt around because they don't want to talk about the slave because their soldiers, the United States soldiers didn't do stuff like that. But yes, that happened. And that's what they did. That and you I, know, nobody was gonna stop them. And for so, for people joining us that might not be familiar with this event, so the long walk of the Navajo was right around a little bit after the Civil War, during and immediately a little bit after. And this one won um, Best of Show at the Autry. And um, the gentleman that bought it, um, he has since passed on. Um, hmm. he, he came up, because uh, we had awards night, and I saw him and the lady, you know, they were looking, and I had my grandkids there. And then the next day, I had my granddaughter, and we were putting the quilt up. Uh, and then uh, a jeweler came by, um, I know him, he's, yeah, um, I know him, I've known him for years, ever since I was little. Uh, he came up and asked me how much, so I told him, and he thought, you know, and I thought he was joking around, he said he wanted to buy, well, he walked away and walked to his booth. Well, like three minutes later, a gentleman and a lady came up, and so they said, tell me the story. So I started telling the story, and I had my granddaughter there, see, I had my granddaughter, Rachel, and my grandson, Big Night Horse. They're the ones that um, are my little business partners. So they, they come in, they, they have to know, that's how they know their stories. So the, the gentleman, Lauren was telling the story. So he was telling my granddaughter, um, he was telling her, do you know about the Holocaust? And so she said, no, mm -hmm. not really. So he was telling how he survived, his whole family was killed. And then the woman that he married, everybody's killed. So they were both you know, orphans and then they only had one son and so he was telling her that when he saw that, it made him cry because I thought about when he was little, he goes, all you have to do is change the clothing, change the hairstyle and change the uniform. And that's what he went through. Yeah. So what he did is he purchased it and donated it to the Autry. So the Autry owns this. So I always tell my granddaughter, you never know when someone comes up, listen to them because they, a lot of people can relate to my stories. Like he said, we can change this. We and that's one of my things is we can change this, like you know, uniforms or and it could be happening right now on the other side of the world. And it's gonna be happening tomorrow. So it's our past, our present, and our future when I make mm -hmm. these quilts. So yes. So that it's it, it's now the um, proud owner, the Autry. I've got a second one um of the year three and four. Mm -hmm. I have that one. So but it's that's, an, the that's an incredible message. And Thank you. This work also is, the subject matter is shifting, but again, it's very much a part of sort of this motif that you're developing in, in the previous work we saw. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Okay, this one is, um, this is at the time when they were putting the children in the camps, putting them in cages. And I was so outraged about that because we, you know, we've been here since the beginning of time and we did a lot of trading. We know no borders. And so a lot of the trading went all the way down to the tip of Argentina, you know, all the way down there. And of course, you know, there's going to be marriages. There's, you know, yeah, I'm sorry, but there's going to be rapes and everything. So children are going to be born. So I always say we are all related. 
one way or another. Whether we're up there, Alaska, up there, all the way down, we are related somehow, somewhere, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, through a marriage, through a rape or whatever. Um, and, you know, when they started saying, well, you can't come over the border because this is the United States. Well, this is not the United States. This is our ancestral cultural land. It's not your land. You guys are invaders. You just, you're new here. And how dare you tell us you, that you don't want them to come up, but you don't put nothing up there in um, Canada. And, you know, and then these are the people that come because a lot of non-natives, they don't want to go out there, pick tomatoes and everything, but you need sure. them need them to come up because they're cheap labor and you can exploit them and abuse them and do whatever you want to them. And so I was so peed off about it. So I said, well, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to do a quilt. And so what I did was I'm showing on the top part. If you look at the building, it's brand new. You can see the color and everything and you see the little trees. And what it is, is showing the soldiers taking the children and putting them in in concentration camps with the wires. That's what a reservation is, is a concentration camp because the land is put in trust, you know, it's trust land. And so you have the little kids there. So what I'm showing is a hundred years later, nothing's different. I change the uniform and put them in the silver blankets. And if you look at the trees, the trees are bigger and the wood on the buildings is older. And I put sayings in there, what I have written in there, it says, what is it? Why, why, uh, why don't you like us? You know, uh, why do you hate us? Because it's the color of hair, color of our skin, because we have beautiful languages. You know, we have a language that saved millions of people, you know, and you're, why are you doing all of this? You know, it's questioning, questioning, questioning. And then, um, so on the title, the real title is the indigenous children want to, want to know why you're racist. I didn't want to huh. put you're racist, why you're racist. Because I want people to ask me about the title and I want to talk about it. Because once I put that there, they won't come up to me. So I just like, you know what, I'm just going to do it in your face. I, I don't care if people like it or not. You know, I've had people come up and it's like, you know what, I don't really care what you think. This is my work and this is, I'm telling the story because it's still happening right now, the second it's going to happen in five seconds from now. I, I, you know, I wanted people to come up and I wanted them to ask questions and I wanted. And so what happens a lot with my questions is I usually get like these little smart butts coming up to me, you know, and then I'll tell them, well, read my quilt. And huh. then it either makes them mad or they'll tell me, well, this, no, this really didn't happen. I go, well, then you're very uneducated because yes, this happened. It happened to every one of us here. You know, every day we have to put up with this, but you know what? We're still here. There, You can't. There's nothing that you've done to us that's going to make us. I, oh my God. So I made this. And so it was controversial, but you know what? I, I, it was pretty, you know, I shocked a lot of people, but, but there's one that uh, at the Autry, the Jackie Autry Purchase Award. So they own this, this piece too, the Autry. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate. Enough for them, um, the missing and murdered uh, indigenous was 1492, and uh, in this quilt was displayed at uh, Idle George. So, um, have the reactions to these quilts changed? Have were the reactions different depending on where in the country you were? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know. But you know what? I stand my ground and then I'm I'm like, well, why did you come to this show if you're gonna act like that? You know, things are gonna be sure. shown. And that's our job is to tell our stories because I'm tired of somebody else telling me a story. I'm tired of, you know, when I was younger, you know, reading books about the same old, same old history thing and it wasn't true, you know, like the Mayflower and all that, you know. Of course. Yeah. So I've got my opinion on that. <laughs> so yes, this belongs to the Autry. So I'm really, really happy. And it won a lot of awards too. I'm really, really happy. So. It's beautiful. And the colors in this particular work are so incredibly evocative. Um, the grays are just so beautiful and rich. And I think that's another one of the striking things about your work is just how beautifully made and how beautiful they are as objects. The craftsmanship on them is just remarkable. Uh, that it, they're just, they're incredible. I'll move on to this work, which I, I 
personally know very well because it this is part of the the Horseman collection and actually is in our in our building here in the Grove. And one of the most incredible things about this piece, and Susan, you'll I can't wait for you to tell the audience a bit more about about the work, but in terms of the craftsmanship, so this is done in reverse applique. So all of the colors that you see on the gray are actually in the layer below the gray. And those gray sections are sewed on top. It's for those of you who are not textile people, it's an incredibly laborious labor intensive technique that is just incredible to behold and gives you those beautiful lines going through it. Um, but Susan, yeah, if you could if you could tell us a little bit more about about sort of the the symbolism behind this piece. Well, this was sometimes you know what I never know what's going to happen when I make the quilts. Um, I had made this quilt, and uh, you know it was during COVID, and the herd museum is usually uh, in March. And what I did was I drove all the way down to the herd and dropped it off. And then um, they, you know, you get juried in and everything, and then they had their awards, and so they had to call me up, but um, they had told me I won some awards, and mm -hmm. so I had in first place and then best division. And uh, they told me I had to do this um, this little Zoom thing. I don't know, and I was supposed to talk about, you know, I had five minutes, but one of the things is I had to thank everybody. And you know, then you know, talk a little bit about the quilt, and and so what happened was um, they had called me on a Friday, and you know, I'm not a tech person. I am I horrible at it, and I went and got my COVID shot, and so I said, okay, let me do this real quick. Six hours later, well, they sent me the wrong week, and that's why I didn't go through six hours. So if you ever watch it, you see me like this because I'm so <laughs> sick. And I'm like this, and I'm so tired of telling the same story. So I'm like, I'm all looking like this. And then uh, then that's when I found out that I had one, um, not only, you know, first place show the I don't I don't while um uh, ribbon, which is really beautiful. You know, they only handed it out to one person per, you know, show. And so I won that and I was really stoked about that. And then um I noticed that the next day when they opened it up, um, then I, you know, then they sent me an email. Somebody had purchased it, and I was like, "Oh, I was, oh, what? 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, jumping around, <laughs> and I'm calling up my kids and everything." And then I realized, "Oh my God, the taxes I gotta pay <laughs> being a tax man." <laughs> but you know, I was so excited. So what I did with this is. Um, I wanted to do a series on missing and murdered indigenous people. And the first one I wanted to do was the women, then I was gonna do the children, then I wanted to do the LGBTQ, then I wanted to do the men. Cause like I said earlier, we're all affected. All of us indigenous people were all affected by it. And so I wasn't sure what I was gonna do, but I knew I wanted to do a tree because and the trees holds a lot of significance in it. And if you look at it, you see that I have the tree and I have little dresses there instead of flowers. And in these trees, I always tell people that when you see an old tree and we're protesting, it's because that tree is sacred to us because those trees, um, they're old and their uh, roots go down. The trees know our history. So if you... um look down on the gray part, you're gonna see uh, what I did was is constructed, deconstructed, reconstructed. Uh, I had a few people come up to my studio and go, what are you doing? I said, I have no idea, but it's gonna work somehow. I don't, I didn't know what I was doing, but I did it. So I got stripped of material and I put it in the uh, uh, underneath and then I got the gray material that, um, that looks like stone. So I started cutting it out to fix it. So you'll see in the middle is a lady with a little girl. What I have is I have a purse with a lady in a red dress and a little girl in a yellow dress and they're hugging each other. The red dress um, 
is symbolic towards the missing and murdered. The yellow is for uh, after Ashland was killed, the you know, United States, the government found out we don't have an Amber Alert. You know, the cities do, but on reservations, we don't have an Amber Alert. So now they have uh, Ashland Mike uh, Amber Alert throughout Indian country. And what I was showing was, uh, you know, the, she was by herself when she was, when she got killed, when she got hit over the head and her, her you know, she was by herself. And so that really hurt me to think of all these babies, you know, even though they're older, you know, they can be adults too. To me, they're still babies. And I thought that, you know, she was by herself. And so when she went on to the next world, that other, um, you know, ones that were killed, the women, you know, and they would be there to greet her, to let her know that she wasn't alone, to give her the comfort that she didn't have when she was by herself. And also these, these, they might be with the Amber Alert, but they do eventually turn into the missing and murdered. Uh, so that was that correlation. And then of course, if you mix the yellow and the uh, red together, it makes orange for the residential children. So that was my thought process behind that. And, and if you look at, uh, you'll see uh, on the sides, I was showing that the roots were going all the way down and that um, all the way to when the conquistadors came, because we were on our side over here, we didn't have like the pilgrims, the Puritans and all that. We had the conquistadors, you know, the Portuguese and coming from Spain and Portugal uh, coming in, they were just doing whatever they wanted. And then people always, you know, they always say, well, they brought you culture. And no, mm. they weren't here. They were here to kill and rape and take over. They weren't here to say, well, guess what? I'm going to teach you how to weave. You know, <laughs> we were sitting on the road saying, hey, the conquistadors are going to come. They're going to teach us how to weave and do silver spinning. You know, it's like people, we, we, had, we were more civilized than these people. So I was showing um, how uh, what they would do is just discard the girls. They just pick them off the side of the, the um the cliff. And then on the other side that was showing where, um, what's that? Oh, that's on the other one. Um, and I can, you know, we looking, can... Looking, uh, looking, and then she finds uh, the little, yeah, the little, the little girl on the bottom. But uh, what, how I decided to do it in this way mm -hmm. is my conversations with Ben. He always says, when you look at a mountain, you see, it's pretty, beautiful, but it's beautiful on the other side, but it's also beautiful in the inside. And so what I wanted to show was if you were to slice that mountain, Mother Earth would reveal the secrets mm -hmm. because when those roots go down, they tell our stories because uh, archaeologists will go layer by layer, you know, and they go down so far and they'll say, okay, this is dated at this, but that's what I was showing. And also those roots when they, they were the, those roots would tell the story to the tree and, you know, know the secrets. So they know where the bodies are of these children, these men and these women are, and they were there as a witness, the last witness to how the child or this young lady was killed um they were there with the last breath they saw the rape they saw the killing they saw everything so that tree has the memory so up on top where you see the grandma hugging the tree is because she knows that that tree knows where that her loved one that is she's thanking it and holding it and trying to get the memories and then the other lady putting up because there's another death putting the clothes up there because a lot of different tribes, what they do is when they get something, they'll put it back. So it becomes part mm -hmm. of Mother Earth. So it goes back to Mother Earth. And then, the, um, you know, like I was saying, like, you know, when you hold something, the memories are there. The memories go to the tree. So the tree knows that. And we, and hundreds of years from now, when I'm no longer here, that tree will still know the secrets. So that's what I was doing on that one right there. And it's kind of the same with the next one on, for the little girls, the, the children. Oh, like right here. Uh, same thing, the trees, but I did all the little dresses and pastels. Yeah. Uh, and also when I did, um, before I forget, all the colorful clothes, um, the 
the, uh, the material, fabric on the back on top, uh, underneath the black. Um, I wanted to show that it represents all the, well, on this one, the other one was for all the women, but this one is all for the little, the, the children. Uh, sometimes how they would find the remains is maybe a piece of fabric sticking up. And I wanted to represent how many of them are missing, how many are gone. You know, they'll they'll put a government's good at numbers, you know, like one in six women or whatever, you know, such sure. as and that. But there's more out there. And uh no one's gonna admit it, you know. And uh, so what I did on this one was it was for the, the children. And in the middle there's a girl there and she's got her little sheep. Uh over there in Fort Defiance, uh when the soldiers were over there, they would do their routines in the morning. And then in the afternoons, they would go out and patrol. Well, they weren't patrolling for safety or anything. What they were patrolling for is they were looking for the little boys and the little girls and the young ladies or that were hurting cheap or just getting firewood. They were raping them, killing them, or selling them. So can you imagine you sending your children out there, you know, um, to go hurt sheep? Your sheep come home, no children. Who do you complain to? Can't complain to the who's ever in charge of the the fort. Because yeah. they're usually in it and they're making money. So that's what I was doing on this one. And then I showed too on um the conquistadors, another thing with the conquistadors. But on the other side, I was showing authority, uh, a soldier, a policeman that's happening now. They just shoot them and you know don't care. Uh, in Colorado, a couple of years ago, they finally rescinded a law that uh, anybody in the state of California that was non-native could go and shoot, uh, shoot one of us and they would get away with it because it was the law that they were allowed to shoot us. In Baltimore, I think it was last year or the year before, um, if they saw a native walking around the street in Baltimore at night, they can get arrested and probably possibly killed. You know, and then I was thinking, I was saying, man, all this time that I was being sent to uh, Baltimore, you know, to fly to Baltimore mm -hmm. to, to go to training, I, they put me in danger. You know? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm. But I mean, it's, it's wild to think. And, you know, people say, oh, well, those laws no longer apply. You know, no one takes them seriously. But the fact that they are still part of the legislative code of the United States or until very recently is just. Yeah, what was that last month where I voted on slavery? I mean, yeah, so it's, 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 people don't realize what we have to go through. Not only do, you know, we have to put up with the fools around us, but we also have the fools that are making laws in, you know, in DC and states, whatever, you know, and it's usually against us because we're the wrong color. Of course, of course. And do you feel optimistic that this this will change in coming generations and uh, presidential administrations? Um, honestly, no, mm. no. Yeah. Because you can't change. I mean, we can vote these people in and everything, we can also vote them out. We can change them, but you know, uh, they're not gonna go against the norm, especially when you're talking about somebody's money. This is mostly about money, you know, what they can get away with. You know, we are serial killers. That's what they are. That's what I call the soldiers, serial rapists and serial killers. You know, we get like, what, that one guy that they caught, what, last week or the week before, he killed, what, maybe four women, they, and he's a serial killer. Well, what about all the ones that are, you know, the soldiers? Look at Sand Creek Massacre, those soldiers, some of them, because um, they got um, Medal of Honors from the state of Colorado. Sure. I mean, killing women and children and elderly in the middle of winter. So it, it's, it's not going to change because there's always going to be greed in mm -hmm. or their bike, in one of the two. Uh, mm -hmm. This is another work in the Horseman Collection that we very, very recently acquired. And this is just, I mean, the work is beautiful. I also 
find this piece so interesting because it harkens back to the star quotes that uh, you were making initially and sort of changes and molds that motif into something very pictorial and very, very different. Can you, can you talk a little bit about this work? Um, this one is, thank you very much for purchasing this. This whole nother story. Oh my God, I was so excited. What I wanted to do on this one was, you know, you know, cause I do talk about the boarding school a lot, about the boarding school experience. And, you know, now it's coming out and people are talking about it. And I wanted to show kind of the difference between Canada Justin Trudeau and at the time, you know, well, all the all the presidents, you know, United States presidents, you know, the, there was a big difference. But I also wanted to honor the children that um, they will never find. You know, mm -hmm. they call them graves, but those are crime scenes. Those little babies were killed, you know, and then nobody talked about them. Nobody honored, you know, um, boarding schools. Horrible. Um, you know, the government had something to do with it, and especially the um, the religious people. And I know people get mad at me because I call them pedophiles. And that's what they were, you know, whoever the missionaries were, the priests. And it wasn't just the men, it was the women too. And what they did to the children, I mean, it was a pedophile paradise for them. And who was going to help these children? Nobody, because we weren't white, we weren't blonde hair, we weren't blue eyes. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was to honor these children because they didn't get the burial for their tradition, for, for what tribe they belong to. You know, we all have, um, uh, every tribe has a way of they're going to do the mourning and their burial. And I wanted to honor these children. We, we don't know their names. You know, we don't know what tribe they're at. We just know a few of them. And I, um, uh, thought about it and so I wanted to have the star there because um in in my in my way, you know, um you we have four days after we have when we're starting our journey, we have four days and on the fourth night we have to go to the next world before that um sun comes up. So a lot of stuff happens at nighttime and that's when they're starting to make their journey. And that's what I wanted to show right here was these little children, these little babies are by themselves, but they're making their journey. What I mean by, the, by themselves is they don't have their parents there or somebody else, you know, taking care of them the, the way they should be, the song, song, song the prayers and everything. And so I decided to bring um, Navajo singers down uh, mm. and sing those songs for them as they traveled up and on the stairs, um, the crosses, they're upside down, and I made them into stairs. I do that because I'm not, um, I don't do the Bible thing or whatever, and a lot of um, religions have destroyed cultures, you know, around the world. Uh, so you see it on the stair, so the one you see that's kind of light, I wanted to show that for the, the little baby baby ones, because um, they, they, their, their lives have ended and you need to make their journey a little bit uh, easier. And then the older ones, you know, go are closer towards us. Mm -hmm. You see them going up and then you see that little grandma right there. And I wanted to um, them to know that even if this grandma walks on, there will always be another grandma there to let them know that they're not alone. You know, mm -hmm. to to you can just talk to them, you know, just say, I'm so-and-so, you know, explain what she, you know, her name and just tell stories, you know, so they can go on their, their journey. And if you look, I got the, um, uh, the ladders going up and then you see the little spirit, they're going up uh, on you know, to the next world. And then uh, between the singers, I had a, a, the little girl up there, putting the orange star. The red is for the missing and murdered indigenous relatives. The yellow is for the action like Amber Alert and the orange is for the residential children. So I made her skirt orange because she's part mm. of that, but um, still hasn't done her journey yet. She's still there. And I made that star really 
really dark and the grays, and that's to rep represent the United States because they don't acknowledge it. And you know, this didn't happen. Uh, and then also uh, when they put that up there, I wanted to, that red too, to represent um, Canada. Oh. Because at least he's doing something. They're recognizing them. They're actually doing stuff. And whereas over here, they're just doing, you know, they're talking and they did a report, and, you know, so many pages, but kind of like, you know, you spend all that money on it. Just ask us, we'll tell you the story. You didn't even spend that much money on there. Do yeah. something. You can do something, you know. Um, so that that's what I was doing on that one. And I just wanted to honor those children to let them know that, you know, their spirits want to come around me and everything, that I haven't forgotten them. I don't know their names in there, but I know they're around. And I know that, you know, whenever I travel, I see them. And, you know, I might not be able to go to Canada or wherever else. So. I just know, let them know that, you know, they have family, family. And, but I wanted uh, those songs. And so down there with the, the their, um, uh, they have bears, one man, uh, one gentleman, I put bears on him because they walk with the bears because the bear is sacred to the, the Navajos and they're, it's our brother, our sister. So I wanted mm -hmm. them that they walk in with the bears. Uh, and, it was just, you know, then I have them singing their songs. I don't know the words because that's their songs. They're not my songs. I think this work is so interesting too because it sort of, it touch, it gets to the heart of so many of the issues you talk about in your other quilts, which is that these missing children and these missing people, it's not, the treatment of indigenous children in this country and the treatment of indigenous women, the murdered and missing indigenous women, those are not separate issues. They're not isolated, different things. They're all connected. And there's, it sort of speaks to the, the systemic nature of challenge of injustices that Indigenous people in this in this country have faced. Correct. It's like they've been allowed to treat us this way since fourteen ninety two. Yeah. Well, actually, Columbus didn't come this way, but I just use that because everybody said that, so people can relate to it. Um, you know, um, even even them coming off the the Mayflower. You know, everybody. You know, I've got so many people from. Oh, I'm a blue blood, um, and so then I'm I'm like okay. So then I get people upset with me because then, then I don't I don't consider them blue bloods. I said, we're the blue bloods. We're here. We're here for being a kind. You guys are just invaders. Yeah. So and but you know, from there, they they did whatever they wanted to, you know, they took over. And so then it's just passed down. So it's kind of the norm for them to treat us that way. Sure. And sure. They know it's gonna happen to them. Nothing. I mean, when's the last time you heard that anybody had anything done to them? Yeah, so, and and kind of this this next work kind of I think very much ties into the to that. Oh, the beginning of the end. This one, um, this one belongs. Uh, this is this one was really hard for me to do. This one because um, the Herd Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, had gotten a grant and they were uh, renovating their new. Um, uh, boarding school um, exhibit there. Mm -hmm. And so they had come up to me and asked me if I would make a quilt. So I said, okay, I go, but I will do it, but you can't tell me what to do and what to say and how to do it, or I'm not going to do it. You, I have to have that, you know, uh, freedom to see, you know, to my dreams and everything. So they agreed to make sure, I make sure of that. Uh, and then I also make sure that um, in the museum, that my my children, my grandchildren, my descendants can go to. They can go over there and see it because that's their story. So they said, okay. So I thought about this, and then so on the so I call it the beginning, and the end, and what it was. If you look up on the top one, that part of the the long walk of the Navajos, uh, you see the soldiers coming, and you see the uh, well. At the first one, you see the kids are carefree and everything, and then in the middle, you see where the soldiers came. And they, um, 
the man, see us, we're a matriarch system. We're the ones that know the bad kids and the good kids and who's going to be the leaders in there, you know. Uh, we make a lot of these decisions, but the government didn't want to deal with the women, so they empowered the men, and that changed our tribe, that their their slot. Because if you talk to a man now, a woman shouldn't hold any position in leadership, which is, you know, whatever. And so um, I, when I do the flags, yes, they're upside down, and yes, that's my way of protesting. And then you see him stepping on the. But when they signed the treaty, they changed everything part of that treaty as the children are going to go to school. So now some of this is you think about all these kids that went through Canyon de Shea or whatever areas where the soldiers came and took them. And along the way, they're, they got, they're traumatized because they're being raped or they're being sold. And then, you know, um, and then they go and they go over to what they, and then they're over there, they're starving, they're dying, you know, and then um, the soldiers, of course, you know, they're um, selling, you know, selling them, you know, to slavers or uh, forcing them into prostitution, you know, for all the farmers around or whoever the visitors come, you know, they're doing all that, you know, starving them. Uh, so this, this happens. So you got trauma there, then they come back and then they gotta go to school. So what I did on this one on the other side is I had the bin putting the children on there because they're the ones that signed the treaty. And also part of it was to send the kids over there. And mm. I wanted to show that. And then on the next one, I wanted to show where the kids went there with their little bags of clothes. My mom always talks about when they went and they took her. And um, she was four years old when they took my mom. And, um, you know, she went through the process of the language. She didn't know English. She knew Navajo. So they beat her. They beat her because she didn't know English. And, you know, and mm. then they cut her hair and they put this white powder on her. And she said, it was just, when you walk in there, there was this powder and everybody was coughing and they were getting beaten because they were crying. And a lot of um, kids, uh, when you cut your hair and stuff, um, especially when it's really close, that means somebody in the family has died. And no one's there to explain to them that no, we're cutting your hair. You know, they yeah. think their family's dead. You know, so you're, these kids are going through all of this and then they take away our beautiful clothes and give them the, I call it the little house in the prairie, the clothes because it's <laughs> ugly, <laughs> you know? And then I did another quote on that about how ugly their clothes are compared to ours. And they're, you know, they're talking about us being savages. They're repressed, you know? <laughs> and so then, and then that, and the next one, you know, we have these beautiful names. I mean, and then they give them, uh, she said they gave them a, a little slate board or a chalkboard and then just put a name on and named her Dorsey, you know? And then, so on mm -hmm. the little slate in the back, I put my family's name up there. And then uh, on the last step, I had them, they're, they're, they're little prisoners, you know, like when they go to jail, they got the little thing there and take a picture. Well, that's what I was showing how they were prisoners. And then I was showing the two religious people uh, so when they're cutting their hair, they're just throwing it on the ground, just disrespecting the clothes and everything and how they're burning their clothes because, oh, they got lights, they got this and that. Uh, yeah. and so I'm showing them how they're trying to kill our culture and our beautiful clothes. Then on the bottom part, you see all the little kids kind of look alike, same haircut, just different color clothes. And um, I wanted to dedicate this, I dedicated to the six. Um, what happened? Oh, my God, we get emotional here. Um, so, um, my mom and my two, her two brothers, um, Tommy and Edison, um, they had the same mother, same father. Well, they ended up, um, living with my great grandmother and then, mm -hmm. uh, Ernest, uh, Walter and Marie, their mother was, had died. So there were six of them. So my great grandmother was watching her, you know, had all of a sudden the responsibility of not only raising her 18 children, but now she had grandchildren that raised. And oh. so I wanted to honor them. So I put down their names in the toilet and boarding school. And then Ernest is the only one still alive. So I put their, put their names down there to honor them because of what they went through, how harsh it was and how bad it was, you know, that they were beaten. They were um, de powder on, their hair was cut, you know, the clothes were taken away, you know, their, their names, uh, and it was just really horrible. They, star they were starving there. 
um, and they were just cold and it, it was really bad for them. So I wanted to honor them that way. And then when the herd did finally show it, um, it was really hard for me because my mother, my mother was dying. Um, my uncle Tommy had just died. And then my mom died four months later. Hmm. So this was really hard to make, but um, um, my mom said, do it. So this is in the museum and it's in the last room when you go through. And then I told them they needed to put something there because people, us quilters, we touch the building where people were touching them. So I told them it's gonna cost them a lot of money if someone wrecks it, I have to go down there and fix it. So um, that's what I did was to honor. And it was kind of cute is because when they when they opened it, when they had the opening, I invited um, my brother, Aaron, that was Tommy's son. Edison didn't have, well, I know Edison had children, but he wasn't, he didn't acknowledge them. So I've got little munchkins running around out there somewhere. And um, uh, Walter's son came huh. and, and, and Ernest showed up. And so, you know, they were talking and introducing. So what, what was really good is that we were all there to talk about the pain that, you know, they went through, you know, yeah. our parents went through that intergenerate, that generational trauma that because of how they were treated, you know, the long walk and all that. And how we grew up without, you know, really knowing how to be parents, you know, nobody taught us because nobody taught them. And, and it was really good. So pretty soon I stepped to the side and I let a light shine on Ernest. And it was cute because every time Travis, Walters and Travis, um, people come bring out their cameras. Uh, he wouldn't go, I come over here. And so, and cause I'm older than, I'm the oldest of all of them. I get over here. So we all take, so every time he sees someone else, uh, with Cam, he'd run over there and get the picture and then he would talk about his father and that was a great thing so you know when I go over there you know I'll, I'll what the herder when they have the Indian market I'll go over there and the people there I'll start talking and I would say yeah. millions of people are going to see my family my mom's name and that's why that's what I did out that one and it was yeah I I can't imagine how much of a healing event this would have been for your family to get this kind of recognition and to be able to talk about the past so uh, that was so difficult so openly and so it's incredible to it's a privilege to be able to to learn about this through you and if only because it's affected so many millions of people in this country it's it's part of our healing and it's part of my you know, having to reflect on, you know, what my mother went through and my, all, you know, I would say my, the, my grandmas that were in that long walk when in the morning when they said their prayers and put that other thing down, they said their prayers for their ancestors, for their children, grandchildren, and they put it down for me, their descendants, my children, my grandchildren. They don't know our, they didn't know what our names were going to be. They didn't know how we were going to come out. They didn't know what we were going to do but they did that for me. So when I go out and I do my prayers, I pray and I thank my ancestors and I thank my mother and I, my, I pray for my children, my grandchildren and my descendants that when I'm no longer here, that my grandchildren's grandchildren are gonna know our stories. So yeah. I, always, I always take that into consideration that they prayed for me, like I pray for them. And I pray for the world because we need prayers. This is will be our last slide, and then we'll take questions from the audience. If, if anyone has questions, I see we have one, but if anyone wants to submit more. Um, and I, I wanted to end on this piece because it's in many ways, uh, similar, similarly to the, to the work we just talked about, a very hopeful work. This one, uh, it's one of those stories, uh, I made this one and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, just put it all out there, you know, on the boarding school. So I call it Keesha Masana Doshite. It means thank you, my my grandparents and my uh, grandpas, my my grandmas and my grandpas, uh, because 
uh, I wanted it in Navajo because it was more beautiful. It's, it's beautiful in Navajo. And if uh, one of my grandmas or my grandpas went by and they saw that, they knew I was thanking them because um, if you, a lot of stuff that they went through. Uh, I wanted to uh, kind of a story for uh, us older people to tell these young kids that our ancestors went through so much. They went so much for you to be here for, you know, we didn't go through all of that for you to be drug addicts, alcoholics, you know, um, homeless, you know, not working. You know, we, they uh, went through a lot. So um, what I did, of course, I went out to the ladies again and then Gina answered me and what she did and what she was talking about when she went to the boarding school, how she was four years old and she was so malnutritious, malnutrition mm -hmm. and she was so tiny, so skinny. And uh, when they put clothes on her, they were just so big and she was the tiniest one there. Uh, you know, in, uh, you know, cause the law says you gotta be five, but she was four at the time, just like my mother was four. Uh, in, uh, and then she was talking about when her mother went to, um, to school, her name was Becky. Um, what they did is, you know, they didn't know English. So to punish her, they threw up mm -hmm. her and a bunch of other kids up in the, the attic and the rats were up there. And she was saying how her mom was, terrified of dark small places and dark uh, and she was terrified of mice and all that because she had been bitten all the kids were being bitten and you know even sometimes they were uh, the, the mice and stuff would come the rats would come and eat their fingers and toes and you know uh, it's, it was just horrific and so I want to but I like care like the children standing up there you know saying they were beaten and they were um she um since one of the things that happened with the rapes was babies. They became pregnant. Well, you're talking about a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, that their little bodies can do. So they were dying from that. And that's where a lot of the uh, bodies were hidden. The, that's why I call them crime scenes, the graves. Uh, you know, or they died during childbirth and the baby died. And so they there's graves out there with these little girls with their babies next to them. Or... Well, what happened was they, you know, give birth to these babies. And if these babies were white enough, they would take the baby away and sell the baby. You know, they would make money. That's what these boarding schools were doing. And then, you know, a lot of them were malnutritious. They starved to death. They didn't have any medication. Uh, you know, all these diseases going on. And so I just put it all out there. And then also... The elders saying, what are you doing? We didn't go through all this for you young ones to do this. What it, it's kind of like, what did you do today to honor or remember your ancestors? Yeah. I do that every morning. Or when I talk like or talk about my clothes and everything, it's one of the things I said, what did I do? I tell their story. And I want to show that even though all that went through, even though we're, my family's dysfunctional, a functional dysfunctional family, <laughs> we have that generational trauma I want to show so I put my mother here where she had went to Toilina but she finally got her AA she finally well I remember when she got a high school diploma and I remember when she got her AA and then AA was a big thing you know and then sure. I have of course my four daughters um some are no longer here so all my daughters are still here so where they went out and got their bachelor's, there were, you know, some are still working on, they got their master's, all because my mom says they didn't teach her how to um, get an education to go on to be something different. They taught her to be a servant. They taught her how to sew. They taught her, you know, all this other stuff. But she always wonders if she had education, she should have, she deserved that by rights she should have as a human being what she would have accomplished in life, our life probably would have changed. Uh, and sure. then I want to show my grandkids there what they're doing. You know, I got grandkids now that are 18 and, you know, no, sorry, they're 19, I forgot. <laughs> but, you know, and what their plans are, because they always remember that, that they're going to make their GD proud. And so that's what I was, what I did over there. And I put that down and it was just, you know, 
it was amazing. I said, I'm gonna honor my mother. And this, so this is uh, honoring my, my grandmas and my grandpas, but mostly my mom because of our education. We could have been a statistics and, you know, not, you know, not done nothing, you know, just, oh, so, yeah. So on this one, what happened was I had to, took it to herd uh, and I entered it. And then I finally got it back. Oh, sometimes it just takes forever to get it. So I got it back. <laughs> so the guy, I hope you guy that I share, Ryan, he's so sweet. Uh, we hung it up. And then 10 minutes later, this, um, this lady came up to me. Well, all the museums came, all the ladies from the museums and stuff, and we were talking about it. And this lady came up and then she looked at it and was listening to me tell the story. And she goes, how much? So I told yeah. her, pull out her credit card. Okay. You know, I, it's, <laughs> I, I sometimes I don't have show clothes for the rest of the years because I sell them right away. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I use it to herd. I mean, how many have I sell to sold at the herd? You guys, you know, you guys are examples, you know. Uh, so that's what I did. And I, I, I want the young kids to think about, you know, when they have all these problems and stuff, there's so many things out there, you know, and I know that, you know, you're not alone. I've been through all that. I've been through all, I've been through so much. The incest, you know, the rapes, the beatings, domestic violence, you know, all of you, you're not alone. I've been there. But, you know, it's hard, but Look where I'm at. If I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Susan, thank you. Thank you so much uh, just for sharing and for, for taking the time to, to walk us through these works, which are so complex and just so full of meaning and symbolism. I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a look at a couple of questions. Uh, I have a one from a viewer that asks, uh, could you share how, a little about how your work is received differently by Native and non-Native communities? Um, so, okay, so I'll give you an example. So the one on the first one, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, mm -hmm. I had so many non-Natives come up to me, oh, look at the doll clothes. And, huh. you know, and then I'll look at them. They're not doll clothes. And I go read, you know, the panels, and they'll usually sure. read the first one. So they'll get pissed off and walk away, or they'll go back and read it. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll, then some will say, "Oh, this never happened. This this ain't happening." Blah 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 blah. And then I then it's like you know, hey, it's go, hey, we're not privileged to the missing white woman, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get a white woman missing, oh my God, it's all over the doggone news. Look, look, right. Example, you know, I well, I feel for the family, you know, like the four students, you know. You you don't see that about four native students, you know, that something happened to them like that. Uh and so, but a lot of times the natives come up, they'll look at it and I won't say nothing and I'll just stand there, you know, because I, you know, I just watch the reaction and sure. go look at it and everything. And then you, you can see them, they're, they, they cry. A lot of them, they'll, they'll cry. And I'll just let them do the crying. You know, I'll give them Kleenex if I have a, a Kleenex around. And yeah. they'll, sometimes they'll walk away, but then sometimes they'll stay and they'll tell me, they'll talk to me. And they'll yeah. tell me their story. I've had a grandma come up to me and then said, I want to show you something and go, you know, in, in my booth and stuff. Well, she, what she did was she was, she went and she said, this is me when I was little. She would bend over and put her head, but she, it was supposed to be a wall, but it was the post of the, the tent. And she said, they would have us on the line and I would be the smallest one. I'd be right there and everybody would rest against us, you know, because oh. they would make them stand for so long. So there are different reactions in different ways, you know, but there are well-meaning people in, in the world. And, but, but just don't come up to me and say, well, my great-great-grandmother's are turkey. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I I actually had one question for you, which is how how old were you when your mother sort of started sharing her her experiences of boarding school and sort of those histories with you? Well, she didn't tell me the story when I was around nine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had to learn how, because we were so poor, we, you know, people donate clothes to us. So she taught me how to, oh, man, you know, fix them. Uh, 
that's oh, I started with clothes before I did quilts, and then the little pieces we would do quilts. But that was my introduction to the boarding school without knowing it. And years later, years later, you know, well, because I used to get hit a lot. Hmm. And so then I would, years later, I would, you know, I didn't want to teach my kids because the way I was taught, um, and I don't like to teach people stuff because I always sure. go back to how I was taught and, you know, I tell my kids I will pay some pay for somebody else to teach them because mm -hmm. I do not want to go through what I did. Um, and it was years later, you know, and then we, and I was telling her, hey, mom, you know, I was I was already in my 20s. And then she told me a little bit, told me a little bit, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, through the years and stuff. And so when she was um, dying, um, we had, you know, those, those, those moments where, you know, you know, she's going to die. And so, you yeah. know, you talk about things. And so she told me more about it. You know, and that was a conversation between her and I, you know, of what she had really went through, a vice, the story that she would tell other people because she was embarrassed to tell people that, you know, the, the stuff that she experienced and everything in. Uh, uh, you know, because people were trying to say that the boarding school was so good, you know, that they were getting fed, they had a good, you know, and all this, and nothing was happening to them, they were becoming educated, you know, and they were mm -hmm. going to go out there over the world. Uh, but, you know, that, so it, it took her, you know, from my 20s, uh, you know, a yeah. four years ago. Oh, that's why I do a lot of stuff, and, you know, because uh, quilting to us, you know, is to honor the ones that went to the boarding school that were beaten like my mother. Um, and uh, to honor them, to take the quilt up a notch to tell the stories. So, sure. you know, I say for my ancestors and stuff, because this isn't really what we, you know, what they would consider traditional art for us. Yeah, yeah. Really new. So I wanted to make it challenging uh, and I wanted to do something different and, uh, you know, and. Little did I know this was going to happen. And, you know, Ben and I, we talk about it, you know, like yesterday, we talk about some of the stuff I do. And it's just amazing what I did. And um, the reception I get, you know, I was like, I never, never in my wildest dreams ever thought I would be here talking to all of you. I never thought <laughs> I, you know, I always thought I was going to die young and, you know, my sewing and everything. Who would have known? You know, and then yeah. when my kids were little, we were so we were still poor when my, I had kids and I would make them clothes and they hated it because, you know, um, <laughs> you know, home homemade clothes. And I know a lot of people, but you know, it was more a stigma of being poor. But yeah, but it's now it's like, you know, my kids have the education, you know, and you know, my daughter, my second daughter, you know, she's a council delegate, kind of a senator for the Navajo Nation, and she gives this you know in her navel skirts and stuff so i make her skirts for her and it was it was kind of it was kind of funny it's like uh mom can you make me skirts what <laughs> remember all the time you used to scream and have tantrums because you didn't want to wear anything i made now you want me to make you skirts so you know I'll, I'll, I'll do it but i like to like hey remember when <laughs> sure sure but i I do that for my daughter. Um, I make her these uh, skirts. I use different material and everything because when she goes to DC, I want people to notice her. I want her mm -hmm. to see how beautiful our clothes are, how beautiful our language is too because of our code talkers. You know, there's other tribes that have code talkers, but our beautiful language, you know, like that one I was showing at the beginning to the end where they were um, beating them for the language. It was our beautiful language that saved the world, that ended that war, that millions yeah. of people died because of my ancestors, or my, my, my chase, um, you know, the, and it's just, and you think about how horrible they were treated. Yeah. So our language saved the world and you're here because of us. <laughs> well, thank you so, thank you again so much. This has been, it's been so wonderful to hear from you and such a pleasure to to discuss your work and it really is an honor and thank you everyone that logged on and uh and listened this uh chilly chilly december afternoon uh, although i'm sure it's not chilly for everyone and um we will look forward to seeing you guys again in 2023 and 
Susan, have a wonderful holiday ahead. Uh, have a wonderful New Year's ahead. And uh, again, thanks, thanks everyone, and take care. Okay. I'll go next.